Hey, welcome to episode number two of A Song is Born. And today we're going to start looking at the arrangement of this song. Previously, in episode number one, we wrote the song, we got the chord structure in place, we got some top lines in place, and today we're going to expand upon that and start putting in sounds. Before we do that, I have to go back to the 80s. You know, in the 80s, if you were lucky enough to get a record deal to go into a studio and record your song properly, that record deal was often based upon either a live performance that someone from a record company saw, or you had submitted a demo to the record company and some people there found it interesting and offered you a record deal. And that demo, well, that was something you often made at home in your home studio. And in the 80s, a home studio, more often than not, uh, was made up of a simple four-track Porta Studio, cassette Porta Studio, maybe a drum machine, and maybe a couple of synths if uh, some guys from the band or yourself had the funds to have all that equipment. Uh, sometimes you had to borrow stuff, etc. But a Porta Studio, a drum machine, and a couple of synths were often the gear needed or used to make a demo. And that demo was what you submitted to record companies. Again, if you were lucky enough to get a record deal, the record company would assign a producer to your project. And that producer would listen carefully to the demo that you had made. And he would decide upon things like changing of the tempo, the key, uh, uh, some parts of the lyrics, etc., etc. He would extract the best ideas from the demos, from your thoughts, your input. And he would distill that, condense that down into the final arrangement and the final song, the production. So uh, a demo. Uh, would often have crucial influence on the final uh, production. So today we're going to start off by making a little demo to get a feel for the, the groove, the tempo, the flow of the song, and we'll extract the best parts from that demo into the, the beginning of the proper arrangement in the door. So uh, let's pull out a drum machine and a couple of synths and get some nice things going, a little beat. And so we're going to make the demo, a simple demo using a drum machine like this one. I pulled out the Alesis HR16, very much used in the mid to late 80s. It was a cheap drum machine, but it had solid drum samples inside it. It was used by many people. And we're going to record those drums into another solution of the time, the Cassette Porter Studio, which uses regular audio tapes for recording up to four tracks and it also had the ability to bounce tracks that is you record it on let's say the first three tracks and you bounce those down uh, onto the fourth track leaving you with three more open tracks to overdub other instruments and that way you could build up more than actually four tracks at a time at the expense of having to mix uh, several instruments together on one track so that was a limitation but it worked very well for recording simple demos like we're about to do here. So I'm taking the outputs of the drum machine, feeding that into line one and two on the Porter Studio, enabling that, and I'm about to record those drums from the drum machine. For now, I've set the tempo to 120 BPMs, and I've uh, made a quick dirty pattern with a kick drum, snare drum, some hi-hats, etc. And we're just gonna loop that and record uh, four or five minutes of drums into that Porter Studio onto the tape so we can overdub some uh, bass and keys. And this is what the producer will listen to and extract the best ideas from when it's about to re-record this in a proper way. So we just press play and uh, off we go. Now this will just loop indefinitely, the same pattern being repeated over and over but you could do more elaborate uh, demos if you wanted to by programming in different patterns, uh, stops, changes, etc. in rhythm. If you wanted to, uh, to make the demo uh, more detailed for a producer or just yourself uh, enjoying later on. So there were no uh, rights or wrongs in this case, but often the demos were pretty basic, especially if you were just making demos for yourself. If you were to send this into a record company to, to, to seal a record deal, hopefully, you would have uh, uh, made uh, more uh, work on the demo than we're doing right here. So we stop the drum machine, we stop recording onto the tape, 
and we disable uh, record enable on track one and two, line one and two, and we rewind the tape and listen to what we've done. So this is the tape machine we're monitoring, the, the recorded drum machine. And depending on the feature set of this Porta Studio, I can do some minor EQ changes and stuff like that, and even send this to a uh, effects unit if I want to. I can also pitch the drums up and down, uh, again, depending on the feature set of the Porta Studio. Sometimes you would do that to record a, um, a difficult passage to play on an instrument later on. You could pitch the whole thing down to, to play it in a slower tempo, but then you'd have to pitch the instrument down as well so that when you return it to its normal pitch, the instrument will follow. Could be a cumbersome ordeal, actually. Okay, so the next step would be to record either a bass part or a harmony part on track three on the Porta Studio. So I'm gonna listen to the drum machine uh, going from the tape and I'm gonna record a harmony part from a synth onto track three. And these are the chords from the song we wrote in episode number one. And this is of course played by hand going directly to tape. going to do the whole thing, this is just to demonstrate how it was done. So I have the keys on track 3, now I'll enable track 4 so I can record a bass part as well. If I wanted to record vocals uh, in addition to those instruments I've just recorded, I would have done it slightly different, I would have had to bounce some tracks down beforehand to leave a track open for a vocal recording, I'm not going to do that here. I will say that uh, some drums, uh, some harmonies from a synthesizer or keyboard, a bass part and a demo vocal, that was really all you needed to, to get your ideas across. That would give everyone listening a pretty good sense of what the song was about and the feel of the song. So those were the essential tracks. As the vigilant ear can hear, I'm using a classic DX electric bass uh, on this demo, and I'm also using uh, a DX piano for the keys. So let's listen to the drums and the keys and record a simple bass part. Here I'm overloading the, the master recorder here slightly, but you get the idea and the bass line I'm playing. Well, this is just something that I play on instinct. Uh, I didn't plan this along for this video. Uh, if I was doing a real demo in the 80s, I would have thought out the bass part beforehand and try that uh, different things. Now this is just done on instinct and what I feel is right. So some of this playing might end up on the final uh, record as well. Uh, who knows? Uh, Again, we're taking ideas from the demo, extracting the best parts later on. So that's the bass part in the can. Let's uh, rewind the tape and listen to the whole thing from the start. This is all coming from the tape. So this was basically how you did a simple demo back in the 80s, in your own bedroom. If you had hopes to bring this to a record company, you would send it or deliver it personally, and if you were lucky, the record company would give the demo to a producer, and the producer would sit down with you as an artist and discuss the way forward. And that way forward is what we're going to look at now. So, the record company has listened to your demo, the producer has listened to your demo along with you as an artist or a band, 
and you've tossed ideas around, you've settled on a tempo, you've uh, settled on the structure, the final structure, etc. And now the producer is going to work with you to record all the parts in a sort of proper way in a professional studio. So what comes next? Well, in the mid to late 80s, the drum machine uh, were often gone in favor of a sampler uh, having its drums sequenced from a sequencer. So the producer would now probably start working on some drums and that's where we will start as well. We will not use a drum machine now. We will uh, sequence the drum samples from a sampler and get the structure of the drums going that way. So uh, let's pull out the Akai S900 and the Atari ST with a sequencing software program and see how it goes. One of the first things you would do as a producer assigned to a new project was to find some suitable drum sounds. You would often start with the drum patterns for the song you were about to recreate from a demo. And just to be clear, from the mid to late 80s, drum machines weren't used as much as before. From 1985 and onwards, samplers were the preferred tool for drum sounds. These could be easily slaved from a sequencer, either from a computer software or from a hardware sequencer. And depending on the scope and budget of this project, that sequencer could also be slaved with SMPTE sync code to a analog tape machine, a multi-track tape machine, where the drums could be recorded individual or the drums could be recorded individual in the final mix down. Uh, again, receiving different treatment, processing, reverbs, compression, etc., depending on the track and what the producer wanted. This was way before the door where you could record audio onto a sequencer in software. So often the drums would be sequenced all the way through uh, to the final mix down where they were mixed down with the rest of the instruments in real time. So here I've pulled out the Akai S900, a industry standard sampler from uh, 86, 87, 88 I'd say. And I've uh, enabled the different drum sounds I've collected over the years that I think will suit this track we're working on. And I've set up different key groups and uh, put these different sounds into those key groups. And the key groups are assigned to individual outputs at the back of the sampler, so I can record these individually. And now I'm going to start working on some patterns and I'm going to slave this sampler to the most used music computer at the time, the Atari ST. At least here in Europe, where I come from, the Atari ST reigned supreme over any other computer at the time. And I'm going to use C-Labs Notator software, a pattern-based sequencer, to start sequencing some drums. And the workflow you're about to see here is exactly the same workflow we used in the mid to late 80s to uh, make out different drum parts for a project like this. There were other sequences as well. You had the Pro 24 from Steinberg and Dr. T's, etc. But in Europe, this C Lab with the creator or notator was very much used. So this is all happening in the MIDI right now. The MIDI sequencer notator here is triggering those drums off the Akai S900 in real time. And the pattern is of course something I've programmed. A pattern sequencer like this is very much like a hardware drum machine, except that you can do it all over MIDI and you have the total flexibility of the big screen, etc. So here I've set up the different drum sounds in MIDI, so I can play those from a MIDI keyboard. Again, these are all coming from the S900 in real time right now. So let's do a new pattern in the Notator software and start by recording some kicks. I'm only needing a few bars because I can loop this uh, within the sequencer itself. Pay attention to the compress ratio there, one to two. I've uh, midi compressed the velocity slightly, so I'll get a little bit more consistent sound out of that kick. And after I've recorded a few bars, I can also loop this. Depending on how much I recorded, a value of 2 is too short, so I'll set it to 4 to loop the whole recording I did. And the quantize is set to 16. So that was the kick drum, and I can label that, of course, like you would uh, today in a more modern door. So that's the kick coming from the S900 on MIDI channel number 1. 
So let's do another sound of that drum kit. Since I'm now programming a pattern for the verse, I'm recording a rim shot. So that's also set to a quantized setting of 16 the same MIDI velocity compression. And I'm looping that as well to uh, get the pattern going on repeat. So I'm gonna label that as well. And we can do one more uh, hat for the verse. All of these separate tracks in the different patterns can of course be uh, changed later, re-recorded later if I want to. And this hi-hat, I will loop that of course, but I will also change the actual velocity, the MIDI velocity information, the MIDI velocity data for this track, as I want the hi-hats to uh, be louder. So I'm not only compressing it, I'm setting the velocity data higher. finding something suitable. Again, these will be recorded individually as audio later, so I can always process them later with the different outboards, etc. Whatever is needed for the different sections of the song and the mix. I want to record one more track with that same hi-hat, so they can alternate between being high and low in volume to get a more dynamic feel in the verse. I will MIDI compress this uh, second hi-hat uh, a little bit different than the first one. So the velocity will be uh, less than the first and that will create a more dynamic feel of the hi-hat like you're playing uh, loud and, uh, and soft, loud and soft uh, alternating. So now we basically have two patterns going. One pattern two is like the verse and the pattern one is like the chorus or intro. And if you wanna put those patterns into a sort of song mode here called arrange mode, like you would on a uh, old drum machine, you can easily do that by uh, dragging those patterns into an arrange window which you can see on the left here. So in the left column here I set the bar number where I want the different patterns to start and I just uh, put those different patterns into that list of uh, playing patterns at certain bars, points, where I want those patterns to start playing. So we have, if I put this arrange window to on and press start Notator will play those patterns based upon the bar number I've put in. So at bar number 9, this should go over to that first pattern which are playing the intro part or the chorus part pattern. As you can hear. So I can drag out one more pattern. So I just rewind this slightly now, you can see that, or here, that at bar number 13, this will go over to the verse pattern again, right now. And like I told you earlier, this sequencer could of course be slaved to SIMPT, a sync code that would often be used to synchronize different types of gear to a analog multi-track machine. But even if this computer software was very powerful at the time, there were people, including myself, that also liked to work with hardware sequencers. So here I've pulled out one of the most powerful and popular sequencers at the time, the Yamaha QX3. This is from 1987. And now this is triggering those samples from the Akai S900. So the drums are now being sequenced from this QX3 instead, which was also a very powerful option. And uh, let's just record that bass part, uh, which you remember from the Porta Studio uh, segment of this video, into the QX3. And 
you heard me playing a wrong note there. Not all sequencers in the mid 80s had the ability to micro edit notes. So if you had a more simple, less powerful sequencer, you'd have to re-record the whole part uh, to erase that. Uh, but in this case, uh, this being a very powerful hardware sequencer for the time, you could go in and easily micro-edit certain notes, points, media information, so you could uh, save a lot of time that way. Sometimes it was more easy to just go in and re-record the part. The Yamaha QX1 and QX3 sequencers uh, could be a bit cumbersome to use if you didn't have those uh, in your hands, so to speak, if you know, knew them by heart, by muscle memory. I must admit, I have a special love for hardware sequencers. They're so fast, so efficient to use. I really like the hands-on touch and feel of them. But ultimately, if this was a big budget production, those sequenced drums, no matter what sequencer you use to trigger them, the drums would end up being recorded onto analog multi-track tape. We will not do that here, but they will be recorded onto a DAW, which will simulate the analog multi-track tape. So let's go over there. You know what? Another couple of weeks has passed and I've decided to scrap the idea for the chorus top line. The chords will remain the same, but I didn't feel comfortable about that top line after working on it a bit more. This is very normal. This was supposed to be a video series where I show you the ups and downs, how you get a song uh, delivered from birth up until finished product and Changes will happen along the way, so this series will show you exactly what's going on. So um, I have to show you that new uh, top line for the chorus now in this segment coming up. And we'll also uh, put in some uh, chords, uh, some bass and a demo vocal, so we can have more to go on for the guitarist coming in any day now. So um, let's go. So we're in the DAW and I'm using Nuendo or Cubase for sequencing and tracking. That is, I'm recording everything into this DAW here. But when it comes time to mix the whole song later, all the audio files we record here will be transferred to another Cubase system on a more modern computer where we can interface with better converters and mix the whole thing analog on the SSL6 mixers. I will get back to that later, of course. For now, we're going to use this DAW to record everything uh, that we're going to use in the arrangement. And I've built up uh, a little thing here already, but I'll take you through all the parts. And this is the window we'll use to, to expand it into the final arrangement. If you remember, we previously sampled those drums into the Akai S900 and we sequenced a little with the Atari ST. And I have those drums here now in red. I've um, recorded the drums from the S900 into the door here. And I've built up pretty much the same arrangement, a drum arrangement as we had 
in the Atari. I've just augmented it a little and put some reverb to some of the stuff just for a scratch work right now. I've also added some congas. So let's uh, solo the drum part and play it from the beginning to see if you uh, remember what we did in the, um, in the Atari. Down here are the congas. And we are in the verse. So this is basically the same drums. Uh, these, these are the same drums as we had in the Archaeus 900. I've just trans transferred them here, recorded them here. So we have now a drum arrangement and I've just put together the patterns that we had in the Atari into this um, arrangement window here. Some of these drums might not end up in the final arrangement. Again, this is just for us to have something to work with now. So I've arranged the structure of the song into uh, the intro, the verse, the pre-chorus, the first chorus, etc., etc., And we'll uh, just chew our way through this now so you can get um, a sense of what's going on here. The scratch vocals are now here in yellow. I also uh, recorded a harmony part. I'll show you that in a minute. And I've recorded in MIDI. Uh, a little bass part and I've recorded in MIDI a little keyboard part. It's important to have some bass going and a harmony part in terms of instruments for other musicians to lay down their tracks later. I'm having a guitarist coming in in a couple of days so he'll do a much better job if he has some uh, vocals, a bass part and a harmony part from a piano to, to work with. I'm also bringing in a saxophonist later and again it's important to have some parts going for them to get into the, the groove and get a feel for the song. So let's play it from almost the beginning and let's see how it goes. So that was the intro. Here comes the verse. Can I go back? Can I go back in time? I wanted more. I wanted to say so much. I wonder why. So, you remember the verse part, the harmonies, uh, the chords are just as they were earlier. And the melody line, the top line, is as we left it in the top line part of that first video. As I've uh, worked a little bit with this scratch arrangement, I kind of think that this uh, part for the bass, especially in the, in the verses, are the right way to go. Let's uh, listen to that uh, E minor 7 and uh, that A with the D bass. So here's the bass part in the verse. And this bass sound has very nice attack and part of the body. But if you listen to that E and one octave below, it has a lot more energy here much more around 80 hertz here than here, which is more in the 40-50 hertz range. And this energy here is uh, much more capable of cutting through the track than this. This will barely be, be heard on a mobile phone or small speakers. So I have to uh, 
I have to layer this bass later with another bass sound that will cut through even more. So I like the initial attack of this and I'd like to use this further, but it has to be layered later. So when it comes to, um, to the mixing stage, we will have layered this bass sound with another sound and I'll get you, I'll get you through those tips and tricks for uh, having more energy in the bass than this will uh, do alone. And this is just a uh, standard electric piano from a DX, which I've sampled into Tal as well, just so I can have it on MIDI for these uh, scratch chords and bass parts needed to, uh, to record more instruments for other musicians. In a little while, I'll take these, uh, at least this one, take this off and, uh, and replace this with a more um, smooth uh, pad sound, I guess. But for now, this is okay for, uh, for this uh, arrangement as we uh, work out the structure and the initial parts. And again, pay attention to the drums. I sort of start out with a rim shot instead of a snare. Going further into the verse, I uh, introduce the snare again. And I sort of take away the snare a little bit as well in the pre-chorus, again, to build up tension, dynamics, and sort of build it towards the chorus. Let's hear that again. I want to And there was a lot of crash cymbals there. I felt it necessary to just add some crash cymbals to, again, really build up towards that first chorus. And of course, that first chorus is now a new chorus. Uh, as time uh, went by from me uh, recording those first segments, uh, I really felt that the chorus should be in a more low key. I don't mean a, a, a key as in a, a, a note type of key. Uh, I felt it had to be more chilled, more relaxed, more down. So I've came up with uh, a new topic theme for the lyrics and a more uh, simple way of doing the chorus. One call, the sound of lying, signs of lying. And if you remember that, ba 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 ba, I think I'll keep that idea for the hook. And later when I'm uh, recording my vocals and sampling some of that vocals, we'll try that again. I left room for that in this new vocal top line as well. And here I've just left room in the arrangement. Uh, don't know why really, but I think maybe I'll fill this up with something cool later. When you hear my calls, feeling lost in time, pick up the phone with a smile. Here there were no crash cymbals, I didn't build up towards this chorus at all because I haven't copied drums over, at, uh, over to this part. We'll do that later, so now the drums are more static and doesn't change as much. 
Now we're coming to that second chorus. And if you remember from the previous video, I have some new chords, the C and D, etc. Halfway through the, through the second chorus here. But the top line now uh, is not sung. I'm only singing the first part of the second chorus. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Let's uh, listen. So, the chords remain the same, the structure remains the same, but I've changed it now, so the top line has gone uh, in favor of some uh, spoken words instead. I feel this is a much better uh, solution for the second part of the chorus, it's more me, I think it sounds 80s. So now we're coming out of that bridge and going into that final pre-chorus. This is the pre-chorus you saw me record in real time uh, earlier in the video and we're doing the final choruses or some of the final choruses. So let's hear how that goes. Forever. So even if we had a different top line before, I think this new top line works very well with these chords and modulations. Only minor adjustments were necessary to the top line, the new top line, to make this work. And I think uh, this will sound lush and dense when I'm finished with everything in this video series. Now the drums has been playing the same pattern throughout the song so far and nothing has changed in this scratch arrangement. So we have two options coming later. We can expand the drums even more, add offbeat tambourines etc. Uh, on the final courses or we can go for the exact opposite and do something quite original. Let's see how it goes. The last thing I want to show you in this scratch arrangement is that very first intro part. You can see it in the green and orange at the beginning there. I have a track called uh, TX816 and something called Memory Moog in orange. And that was a intro I just felt was necessary to, to build up uh, in the very beginning of the song. And I recorded uh, in the spur of the moment two sounds, one from the Yamaha TX816 and one from the Memory Moog. I recorded it through the preamps with a final sound in mind, so let's check that out. And I think I'll add a little bit of guitar as well to that very first intro part. I'll have the guitarist do just that and we'll see how it goes. So far I really dig that intro and for now I think I'm going to keep it. Well, as you just saw, I've recorded a lot of segments for this uh, episode number two of this series. 
over the last eight weeks or so, I've uh, edited this down to, yeah, what you just saw. And I think this is a uh, faithful representation of the workflow from, uh, from the, the, the writing, the composition of the song. Uh, to this episode number two where we started to arrange the song based off a demo just to show you what it was like in the 80s going from that scratch pad over to a more elaborate scratch pad which will now expand into the final arrangement. So we've got some drums going, we have a scratch vocal, we have some bass and a bass sound that might or might not end up being the bass sound we're going to use. And we have some keys, uh, some chords going. And this will be essential now that we go into episode number three and we'll start adding more and more sounds, more and more texture to this, uh, to this song. So I can't wait to, to start on episode number three and I hope to see you there. So uh, see you next time. Cheers.